Hello, everybody. Good afternoon and welcome to another session with CBD Standards this afternoon. Um, it's glorious out there. So thank you all for joining us. Um, my name's Amanda, Amanda Rosevorn, for those of you that haven't met me before. And um, this is one of our regular sessions that we run for um, the CPD standards community, uh, covering basically all things um, for trainers, coaches, and online educators. And we're absolutely delighted this afternoon to be delivering this session in one of our providers, Keith Daniel, uh, running the session for us. So um, very much looking forward to just a really interactive session, which is what we're going to try and aim for. Um, what we normally do, for those of us that you've joined um, before, is we do ask in the sessions that you have your camera switched off and that you go on to mute. Now, we're not going to ask you to do that this week um, because there is going to be some live sort of examples and interactive participation. Um, but just one thing to know is that if you, if you do decide to do that, then the recording is going to go up onto YouTube. OK, so um, we want to have you all involved and, uh, and participate in, but just be aware that the, the recording will be then on our general channel on YouTube. Um, so thank you for all of you again for dialing in. It's, it's always a great pleasure and a great honour to, to just see you all and, and say hi. Um, those of you that have been on the webinar many times know that prior to the pandemic, this wasn't something that we used to do. Um, we always delivered face-to-face -face member networking events. Um, and whilst that was good, you know, and, and we can't get, back, you know, we can't wait to get back to actually see some of you in person. Um, what we have managed to achieve with this webinar series is being able to talk to everybody and anybody um, all over the globe. And I think in total now, as with the reruns as well on um, on YouTube, we, we've connected with just over 6,000 people in the last year or so. So um, we're delighted to have you as part of the community. And I know that some people that are on the session today are members and some people are uh, our subscribers. So if you do um, decide to join in, then just please raise your hand and, and let us know whether you're one of our members or not. Um, there's not really much of an update from me um, at this point. Um, I think, you know, I always kind of give a general overview of where we are in the terms of the industry um, situation uh, for trainers, coaches and online educators. I think things are picking up. Um, I think it's really positive at the moment. I've heard a lot of success stories and positive uh, news from, from various uh, providers and, and people that we're connected with. Um, Boris's roadmap, although, you know, there's a few crinkles in it at the moment and, you know, we might be opening on the 21st of June, we might not, etc. I think we've, for the training industries and online education particularly, there's definitely been some green shoots of recovery. Um, we, we still are experiencing and working with members who are finding it extremely difficult to, to, to bring their business through the pandemic. Um, but fortunately, this seems to be going more into the minority. minority. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, there's been a huge swell in online training. And, um, you know, somebody said to me the other day, no matter what, what do you think, should I start a, a coaching business? And I said, well, and I sat and thought about it and thought, well, to be honest, I don't think there's ever been a better time to be in online education or coaching, um, as long as you've got, you know, all the right skills and everything. Um, the thirst for online learning has just been exponential. That's all people have done if, if they've been furloughed or, or made unemployed in different capacities and through different channels. So um yeah i think you know and certainly as, as you as members will know that we work with you and support you as much as we can in order to make sure that you're the best trainer or coach that you can be and also you know receive and build a sustainable training or coaching business but anyway that's enough from me i'm going to hand over to keith now who's going to 
talk to us and interact with us about communicating with impact. Um, so I will hand over. I will switch on my camera off and go on to mute so it's not distracting. Um, if you have any comments, or comments in the chat, if anything isn't kind of meeting your expectations or you want to talk about something else, then please do message me directly um, so that we can really keep that conversation on point. Okay, so over to you, Keith, and thank you. Thank you, Amanda, and good afternoon to everyone. I'm sitting here just outside Nottingham looking out at beautiful, glorious blue sunshine. So the fact you've actually taken the trouble to come and be here for the next hour or so makes me very grateful. Thank you very much indeed. And I'm conscious as well that I'm talking to people who are trainers and experts and know what you're talking about. So that makes this afternoon session a little bit more challenging as well. However, the good news is for me that you're going to be doing most of the work. The way I'm going to run this is I'm just going to give you my background for two or three minutes and then go through some little things that I think mean we can communicate to the best possible effect. And I suspect, given what you all do, you will know a lot of this stuff already. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with the refresher. And if you've got any questions at any point, please just either put them through the chat function, as Amanda said, or, or stick the old pour up and we'll, we'll go to you straight away. When I'm working like this, I don't look at the chat function because I find it a distraction and I like to look at you. So I won't be monitoring the chat function, but Amanda will. OK, my own background to start with, I desperately wanted to be a professional footballer. Wasn't good enough. Some people say it wasn't anywhere near good enough. And I'll now be willing to accept that, though, at the time I wasn't. So I fell into broadcasting. And for around 20 years or so, I earned my corn as a journalist, as a television presenter, as a producer for ITV, ITN and Channel 4. And then realized I was getting a bit older, realized I was losing a little bit of hair and went out and with my wife set up my own business. And we became, through a curious quirk, one of the biggest providers of online checking, CRB checking as they were then, Criminal Records Bureau checking, now DBS checking. And then about three or four years ago, that was bought out the blue really by a PLC. And then we sold another part of our business to a management buyout. So this is what, I do now. I work with individuals, executives, organizations on how to maximize the message, the message, the messenger and the means. OK, so that's my background. Right. Now we go on to the more fun and interactive bit. And as I say, a lot of this, I think you will already know, in which case I hope you're not going to be too bored. I always start my sessions, particularly in this virtual world, by trying to make sure people have got their camera set up in the best possible way and their zoom link set up in the best possible way and why is that because at the moment we are edging back to reality but at the moment we're still using this technology and i think we'll continue to be using this technology which means whether we like it or not we are all television presenters because i'm here sitting at what 30 40 people all i can see are little matchbox sized pictures of you but they're television sized pictures of you, which means you are television presenters. So let's do three exercises before we do anything else. If you can put your cameras on, that's great, because it's much better for me if I can see you, okay? By all means, leave the sound down, but if I can see you, I can then try and interact a little bit more as we would do in the real world. Okay, so starting point, if you can, Join me in putting your hands up to your eyes for me like this, at this kind of level. OK, terrific. Now, why do I do this? Because ideally, and when you are setting up a, a camera shot in television, the ideal scenario is that your eyes are basically two thirds of the way up the screen. So if I look at the little matchboxes of you around me, Laura, for example, is down here. The hands are down here. Hi, Laura. So it's much better if we just lift the camera up to become about two thirds of the way up the screen. Makes a huge difference. And then the other thing is if we then hold our arms out horizontally, okay, ideally we're then gonna fill the bottom third of the screen. And in a very, very rough rule of thumb, those two little things basically mean that we, as the audience now, are seeing 
us seeing you, the participants, to the best possible effect. And that means we get the kind of best image of you that we can. And that means we will see you and like you, hopefully, but actually be able to see you properly. The next thing I get people to do, and this is going to feel really, really stupid, but please join in with me, is to actually feel with your hands for the edges of this little matchbox within which you are sitting, okay? So if you just feel for it, right? Great. So Ray, for example, I'm looking at you, okay? I'm looking at you at the moment, Ray. And when you are, now you see with your left hand, you've now gone outside the box, okay? So I'm watching Justin, Justin's doing it brilliantly. Okay, perfect. Katie, you're right on the edge, fantastic. Now, why does this matter? This matters because if we go outside the box with a gesture, it's of no value. So I am holding my hands up now in a real position of sort of Roman emperor style activity, but you can't see it. Whereas if I do it like this, you can see it and it has effect. If I make a very adamant point with my hands below the crease, below the cutoff of the screen, you can't see it, so it's pointless. Whereas if I do it here, then it has an effect. So my point of this is very simple. By feeling for the parameters of the screen, like a television presenter, we can actually maximize the box and the space that we've got and within which we're working. OK, it's a really simple trick, but it's often worthwhile doing just before you, you go into the session. OK, now let's have a look at another very simple thing, which is light. OK, so let's have a look, for example, at Richard, Richard Isaac. OK, really good example. So if we look at Richard. What can we see on Richard's screen? So we can see Richard, but. The whole of the right hand side of Richard's face is in silhouette. Now, if we are going to maximize impact, maximize engagement, maximize the perception we're creating, then we don't want anything which distracts and therefore detracts from the performance that we're actually delivering. So in Richard's case, what I would do is try and encourage him to actually reposition where he is. So the light is coming onto the face, okay? Because actually we want to be able to see you. So if I just reach across for a second here to my light, so I've actually got a desk lamp. So yes, I'm reaching out of camera for a second, but if I put my desk lamp on, and I don't know if you have one, Richard, then suddenly you can actually elevate you a little bit more. So having the light makes a difference and even a desk lamp can make a difference. Ideally, you want the light coming on towards you, and what we don't want, of course, is the light behind us, because if we're not careful, that makes us look like a silhouette. So we don't all have the luxury that Andre has, for example, of sitting outside in a beautiful green space with the sun. That's terrific. But if we're inside and our camera is facing a window, then actually, if we're not careful, we become a silhouette. So I'm looking at Dawn, for example, Dawn Rutherford. And what Dawn has done very sensibly is draw the blinds behind her. If Dawn were to reach round, I don't know if you can possibly do that for us, Dawn, but if you were to reach round and undo those blinds, hopefully this will demonstrate exactly the point that we're making. So by undoing the blinds, suddenly the light, actually she's done them quite nicely, so she's just half and half, but we can get the effect. Suddenly we're a silhouette, okay? So by cutting out the light behind us and by having a desk lamp, Amazon have some nice ones, I'm told, I think 12 pounds, they're kind of like halo lamps that can make a huge difference. And this is particularly important for black and Asian faces. I do quite a lot of work in the BAME community. And certainly in my television days, the lighting technicians always had to take extra care to light a black and Asian face to get the best possible perception of it. So it's really worth just playing with it. The zoom and the team's cameras are very good, but they're not perfect. And therefore, if we can help them by having this light coming on to us so much, the better. OK, first bit done. I think I've said enough. What would be nice now is to have a volunteer. Can I have a, a volunteer who wants to just talk to me for 30 seconds and give me their story? Put your hand up if you're willing to be that volunteer. Laura, brilliant. Thank you very much. OK, so we'll go with Laura first. So, Laura, if you just talk to us for 30 seconds or so, 
and just tell us about you. That'll be terrific. Well, um, sorry to, to interrupt. You need to unmute. Unmute as well, Laura. Mute. Perfect. Thank you. Classic mistake. So I, I do a lot of online coaching. I work, I'm a contractor for Better Up. So I coach people all over the world. And my specialism is communication coaching. You might not uh, have much of a view of that after this session, but I'm here to learn today. I do too much coaching and teaching of others. So I really want to start to push the boundaries of my skills. Most people come to me because they want to be able to contribute to meetings more effectively. They want to structure presentations and they want to have the confident presence that they need in order to make an impact. Great. Now, normally what I do when I'm playing these sessions back, I record and play back straight away. I can't play Laura back today, unfortunately, because we don't quite have that technology. But let's just pick up a couple of things that Laura did really, really well there. And one was warmth, okay? Not a Cheshire cat grin. We don't want a silly smile but warmth. She was engaging and warm. And that meant we responded because I was looking at your pictures as well at the same time as I was looking at Laura. And because Laura was warm and engaging, you responded with warmth as well. So brilliant. OK, I think I saw a couple of other hands go up. So who else was volunteering? Stick the old pour up again. Tom, let's come to you next, Tom. The reason I'm, I'm creeping popping over here because I'm just wondering if I can try and record you and to do that I need to come across to another screen but while I'm doing that Tom in 30 seconds okay you're unmuted so off you Fantastic. go with please. Uh, thanks Keith good afternoon good afternoon everybody uh, my name is Tom Cayman I live in uh, Will on Merseyside I coach I train um, I assess apprenticeships I also write train kittens for the for the police so I have a very broad uh, um perspective on education and training um, but I constantly constantly strive for better to be better um, and I'm really interested in today because obviously being now online it's better spend my time and already I picked up some fantastic tips from Keith that I will keep for a long long time and also pass on to others so thank you already Keith it's been very informative and I hope I'll learn more this afternoon as well thank you. Now, thank you, Tom, for that. Did you notice how about halfway through Tom started smiling? OK, which is terrific. So the start, Tom, was very neutral. The second half was much warmer and engaging. And immediately everybody else started smiling as well. There's a phenomenon for this called serve and return or, or emotional contagion, if you like, which basically says if you smile, I'll smile. If you look miserable, I love miserable. So it's that kind of connection. And it doesn't mean a Cheshire cat grin because we don't want to be silly about it, but it means warmth. OK, so that's terrific, Tom. OK, I think I saw another hand go up as well. Who else popped up? Justin. Great. OK, so let's have a look at you then, please, Justin. Oh, good. Good afternoon to you. Yes, Justin Douglas is my name. Delighted to be here. I absolutely love this subject. It, it, I do actually a, a lot of work. Um, training in communications, but also one-to-one -one coaching uh, around careers. And sometimes it is about communications as well. Um, so for me, it's very exciting to join someone such as yourself, Keith, who's been in the, in the television public eye, as it were, uh, to actually get, get some new tips. And, and, and like Tom, I've also learned some great things already. So thank you so much. Right. Now, what you've just done there, Justin, leads me in really nicely to a little example. So what you did, Justin, was had enthusiasm in your voice, which was terrific, and warmth, which I love. But did you notice how Justin used his hands? OK. Like this, a couple of times, two or three times. Now, my view on this is very simple. If you talk naturally to a friend in a coffee shop over a drink, you will use your hands to express, okay? That's what we do. And yet I am told that a lot of people when they're being coached on how to present are told not to use their hands. I think this is silly. I think this is really silly because if we do that, we deflate the whole effect. And I want you to be the best you can be, which includes making you completely natural. So what Justin did there was absolutely brilliant. 
However, I think there's a couple of little things we can do to make it even better. And I haven't got slides with me today. So what I'm going to do, excuse me just one second. I'm just going to, I've actually got shorts on. So if, I, if you see my legs, forgive me for a second. Right. Okay. A little picture that I have behind me here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is hold this up to the camera. Okay. And when I hold it up to the camera, all I want you to do, everybody, if you can, please, is just show me how big is that fish okay just show me with your hands now how big is that fish great okay so let's just analyze what you all did there okay this is a really nice little technique even tom until i let him go just then was still holding his hands now what I actually asked you was to show me how big the fish was. So what you've all done is taken a view of the fish and given me different sizes. OK, that's absolutely fine. Size is not the issue here. The key point is what you actually did with your hands. And I think this is a really important point for the Zoom world, but also back into the real world, too. What you all did was take your hands and hold them. OK. Not one of you said the fish is that big. OK, you all said the fish is that big or that big. Now, this matters because if you watch any accomplished speaker, what they do when they use their hands is make the movements positive and definite, not disposable. So there's a huge difference between saying the fish is that big and between saying the fish is that big. That big has no value whatsoever. That big looks dynamic and powerful and impressive. And the perception is changed. So the reason I use the fish, it's really simple. If it's a wriggly fish, it's horrible. But if it's a positive and definite fish, then it enhances the perception that we're creating. And it's little things like that that start to make a difference. So I say as a very simple rule of thumb, Hold the gesture for three. I'm very simple. Once you've held it for three, the hands can come down. Yes, Jackie, are you showing me a fish or are you putting your hand up for a question? <laughs> You're showing me the fish, terrific. Okay, so that's a really simple one. And Justin did it well. My view would be hold the gesture and then we enhance the way we're actually delivering it. Okay, right. Keys. If yes, I, Justin. I, yeah, thank you. Can I just comment? I, I think this is so interesting because one of the things, and including that position on the screen, you know, if you're right down here or, you know, over here, the the big thing in the virtual world is that it's so, our, our brains are having to do so much filling in. So you're right, if we hold the gestures, if we're in the right position, our brain, you're making it easier for our brain, for other people's brains to interpret what in the face-to-face -face world is much easier to do naturally. And that is a really good point, Justin, because in the real world, we feed off our audience all the time. And as you say, we do it naturally. In the virtual world, we lose a lot of those little cues. And that's why bringing them back into play enhances the perception we're creating. But just to go back to what I said earlier about being a television presenter, if the fish is this big, the gesture has no value. So the fish has to be within the boundaries, within the parameters of what we're trying to show. Mm. Keith, just a, a comment yeah. from me, if that's OK. So I, I've, I've had this question a lot um, about uh, gesticulation. Um, so I think it's a really interesting area for us to cover. As you can see, when I'm in my natural phase, I, I love using my hands and, and on a face to face basis. You, you know, as a trainer, it's always important that you downplay the, de the gesticulation. Um, so given that we as trainers and coaches online and via Zoom now need to use a little bit of gesticulation to kind of bring to life what we're saying or, you know, create a point, how much is too much? Well, you'll know when it's too much. OK, so if I go like that the whole time, right yeah okay it's too much isn't it but if i've got a really important point to make and i go like that and i hold it for three that's not too much 
Okay. okay. That's so what I think you I know think. as a trainer, you know when you've over it, don't you? Okay. I think but, I think some people do, but I've also seen, sorry to play devil's advocate, I've also seen um, and worked with quite a few people that have been quite nervous, uh, particularly in the early stages of using Zoom and having the distraction of seeing yourself online, your, your own face online, as well as everybody else's. And, um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's kind of a little bit overwhelming. I think we're a year down the line now, so people are a lot more used to it, but certainly in the early days, <laughs> um, it was a baptism of fire for some. Yeah, I think that's right. But I would rather people are natural Yes. And then use the control of it. The bit we don't want is that, okay, mm. which is the kind of whoa, 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 whoa. And that's when it becomes a distraction. But actually, if you're making a point, you will use your hands, not over the top, not all the time, not on every single sentence. But mm. actually, if you've got a point to make that's worthwhile, sometimes you will make it. But let's hold the gesture. Yes, Tom. Oh, thanks, Keith. Um, it's a bit of a different question. If you don't mind, please, it's to do with backgrounds. So behind me it's blank, that's not intentional. I've just recently moved house. Um, but what I find is, um, um, I don't mind, I don't get distracted by it, but, uh, people uh, using hands, etc. But we're, we're all naturally nosy and we all naturally look beyond the person. And sometimes I find myself being distracted by what's behind the person and, and losing interest and find sometimes more interested what's behind them and then listening to them. Um, is the a magic wand in this area or am I off track here? Um. Okay, so I have a few views on this. My personal view is I don't like the virtual backgrounds because I think as soon as you start to move your head, you end up looking like sort of Doctor Who from 1973. <laughs> so I personally don't like the virtual backgrounds. I know there is a corporate argument for them in certain situations, but I don't like them. So my view is, what we need to have is a background which is natural, which is us, but which isn't a distraction. If it distracts, then it detracts. That's an expression I use quite a lot. If it distracts, it detracts. But so long as it's not a distraction, then actually I'm pretty relaxed about it. So I'm looking at Jessica, where there's a nice pot plant hanging down behind her. You know, I'm looking at John, where there's some interesting books. On the other hand, I'm looking at Fiona, where Fiona has made the decision to blur out her background. Now, personally, I don't like that. You know, that's up to you, Fiona. I'm not trying to tell you what to do and what not to do. But I actually don't like it because I find that more distracting than actually having a background. And we're able to absorb a lot of information very quickly. So the fact that we can see a background and we find it interesting, so long as it's not a distraction and therefore detracts, I don't think is a problem. I would prefer something interesting, but not distracting, than nothing, okay? So if I look at Laura, if I look at Katie, for example, you have very, very plain backgrounds behind you. Personally, I would say something is better than nothing. Maybe a pot plant, maybe a picture. But clearly, if it's an inappropriate picture, if it distracts, then that's a no-no. So I don't think there is an absolute hard and fast rule on this, Tom, other than the fact that it's not as though you are distracted to the point of switching off. You're simply distracted because you're taking an interest in it. And I'm absolutely fine with that because we're able to absorb an awful lot of information at the same time. I think the plan point is an excellent point because it's natural as well. It's interesting because I'm, I am distracted by Fiona. I'm also distracted by Ruth for different reasons. Uh, not the background. Um, I'm trying to find Ruth at the moment. I can't see. Did you say Ruth? Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. I see. Because the painting is so luxurious. Yeah. Yeah. I can see. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I think one. Fiona has a question. Fiona, did you have a question? I was just going to say um, that the reason why I blurred my background is because it's quite messy. Um, obviously, I have control over that and I can tidy. Yeah. Um, but when I was first using Zoom, I had just a plain door behind me and now I've moved into a different room and it's completely different. Um, but thank, th I just want to say thanks for that. Um, thanks for the feedback. What I also found, which other people might find useful, is I blurred my background for the first time on a training session that I was doing that had more than one iteration. 
and instantly everybody was asking where is the button where i can do that fancy background and completely took away from the training yeah. and it took a few minutes to regather everybody and for me to say i think that perhaps we should play with all the zoom fancy fancy gadgets in the break and everybody said okay <laughs> And it really backfired. I, I wanted them to not see the mess my room's in. And actually, the only way is to tidy it, isn't it, really? <laughs> I think so. It's one of the few things you've got control of. And therefore, take control of it would be my view. I think that's the important thing. I can see Ruth has got your hand up, Ruth. Is that to ask a question? I've also got a question as well. Uh, I was going to talk about uh, Amanda's view when she was talking earlier. And uh, one of the things I found that helps quite a lot with the uh, students is to hide self view. And it particularly yes. helps neurodiverse um, students who can't concentrate as well as people who haven't got some of the issues that they've got. Uh, and it makes such a brilliant difference because the brain isn't working anywhere near as hard to try and work out what's going on. And then I wasn't going to talk about my background, but it's the best icebreaker that I could ever have. So yeah, <laughs> well. I think the the just while I'm on that one little thing about the, the self view bit, because some people like to be able to see themselves. Some people hate being able to see themselves. I'm, I'm not saying there's a right or wrong answer here. But what I do like is people to have that warmth in their face, because that generally means that you're engaging more with your audience. And actually, if you can see yourself, it can remind you to retain the warmth. But just in case you don't, one little trip that I suggest to people is keep a picture. So this is my daughters, well, they are my daughters. The, the smaller one actually got married at the weekend. So that was a nice day for us. But why do I keep this next to my screen? I have it blue tacked next to my screen. And it's very simple. It makes me smile. And if I'm in the middle of a long session and I'm in danger of going miserable, actually, I know that is going to lessen the impact that I have with my audience. So therefore, I have a little picture that makes me smile. And on the other side of my screen, just to finish the story, I have a smiley face, okay, which again is just stuck onto the side of the screen, just to make me smile. And one other little trick, you're probably aware of this, you can't do it with teams, unfortunately. But with Zoom, the technology does allow you to do it. And I'm sure you know of it. But, but if you hover with your mouse, certainly with a PC, I don't know whether it works with a iPad, but with a PC, if you hover over the little matchbox of you, you get a kind of hand that comes up like that. And if you do a left click on that, you can then drag that particular matchbox to any position on the screen. And what I encourage people to do is to actually drag their picture of themselves to the top row. OK, why do I do that? Because if you're on the top row, you are closer to the camera. And mm. that means your eyes are going to be that much nearer to the perspective that other people have of you. Whereas, let me try and give you an example. If I was looking down on the bottom row of my screen down here, where Sonia and Katie are, actually, the whole perception is different. Whereas if you're on the top row, the eyes are that much closer, and that tends to mean that we have that extra little bit of engagement. Mm. Right, but one of the things you mentioned on just eyes... Make is, point uh, there, yeah. yeah, just to make a point there. So when we first started doing the webinar series a year ago, it was, a, as I said, it was a baptism of fire. It was for us, it for, was for everybody else. And um, we, we had a lot of these conversations in the early weeks um, when the first lockdown was in place. You know, how are we going to deliver really good training via Zoom? And what are we going to do when you're talking into just a little light on a screen when you're actually used to being in a room with a group of people? And one of the best tips that uh, somebody gave on one of the webinars and something that I know a lot of people took up at the time was to create or print off a photo of either a load of delegates that you've trained previously or a family photo or anything and literally stick it above the screen above the camera so as you're presenting you could almost go back into face-to-face -face mode because you had a little set of faces they weren't the faces that you were training but to kind of give you that environment because it was such a jump um for people that were only used and had only ever wanted to deliver face-to-face -face training so I think that's, 
yeah, it's a nice idea. And in effect, if you go to gallery view rather than mm -hmm. individual view, gallery view kind of gives you that. Yeah. Now, while I'm while I'm on that subject, then before we bring anybody else in, let me just do one little exercise, and then we'll pick up on something else. Because one of the things that is a huge distraction, and I'm going to use that expression again, if it distracts, it detracts. But one of the things that is a huge distraction is what I call the Zoom flick, okay? And let me try and give you an example of what I mean by the Zoom flick. And to do that, I'm going to actually do this little piece directly to camera, okay? So with my TV background, if necessary, I could actually deliver, because I used to deliver programs just to TV, okay, just to the camera. But by and large, our eyes will also take in the screen where the people with whom we are interacting are. But one thing people do a lot is that, or that, or that, okay? Particularly if they've got notes or a distraction or if they've got their phone going and a message comes in, which by the way, in my view is a complete no-no. But if you've got notes, the classic thing people do is flick, okay? Now, that looks horrible, because if you are interacting with somebody in a coffee shop, a tea shop, a pub, your partner, and they keep flicking their eyes away, it really sends a terrible message. It tells us this person is not engaged with us, they are distracted, and actually they're thinking about other things. So the Zoom flick is awful. So what I encourage people to do is something rather different, uh, I said before, I'm very simplistic. And everything is to the power of three with me. So instead of a zoom flick, we look away to the power of three. So again, I'm going to get you to do this in a minute, but let me give you an example. So this is the zoom flick, okay, which is horrible. I told you that I'm not really concentrating on you and you probably don't trust me. On the other hand, if I now look at my notes for three seconds and then come back, actually, I look more intelligent. It's ridiculous. But the look away for three is fine. We get that. But the zoom flick is awful. So just for a second for me, if you can, just look to your camera. And I'm going to look at you rather than my camera. OK. And what I'm going to do is count to five. And as I count to five, I want you to flick your eyes each time. Just one second. One, two, three, like that. OK. And then I'm going to count to three twice when I actually want you just to look left or look right and hold it for three seconds, okay? And when you play this back on YouTube later on, when, when they put it on the YouTube link, you'll see the difference. So, are we all ready? Okay, so we're gonna start with flicking five times. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, okay? And now a positive look to the left for one, two, three, and now to the right for one, two, three okay the perception is completely different and it's a stupid little thing but if we can get ourselves out of the habit of the zoom flick and into the habit of the kind of intellectual eye movement well suddenly we enhance <laughs> okay. okay stupid but it makes a difference okay were there any more questions before we have somebody else Amanda, every time you pop up, I'm assuming you have a question. No, I just I just love the thought that everybody looks more intelligent if they take some time to look away. I think that's probably the best and the nicest thing I've ever heard for all of our trainers in our community. <laughs> Count three seconds and, and your the perception of you improves rather than um, disapproves. Well, the, the real key here, Amanda, OK, the real trick here, and I don't think we're going to get through this in terms mm -hmm. of just one off session today. But the real trick is to align the look away with the appropriate pause mm -hmm. and in the real world to the movement, because then that creates the maximum engagement. OK, mm -hmm. so let me try and give you an example. I don't know if I can do this, but I'll try and give it to you. Okay, So if I'm talking to you about how I think communication really matters and fundamentally what I talk about is the messenger, the message and the means. So let's just think about the messenger, first of all. You know, messengers are fundamental to society. OK, so what I've done is try to align the eye movement away with a strategic pause, which then 
I pick back up on. Now, all these little things, everything I talk about is stupid and everybody knows them already, but all those little things start to add up. And if we actually pause, we get a double whammy from it. And I'm sure a lot of the trainers here know this, but if we get a double whammy, we get a benefit for what we just said being perceived as more important by our audience. And they then think what we say next is more important too. And so often I see people, I mean, Laura was talking earlier about training. When you ask people to talk straight away, what they tend to do is fill the whole time, the whole space, let's say it's 30 seconds with noise. It's much more powerful if we actually create pauses in there because it gives a double benefit. It gives what we've said more, ben more importance. It gives what we're going to say more importance. But one of the real challenges is building the confidence in the individual to actually know that they can pause and create greater impact, which is why as, as trainers collectively, I'm sure you'll all agree, a one-off hit with someone tends to be of limited value. You know, you can do a, one session with someone and frankly, that might be okay, but it doesn't maximize the impact. Yes, John, I can see you've got your hand yeah. up, John. Yeah, Keith, I, I talk about the audience uh, thinking process as being the most important part of a presentation. If they're not thinking, so it's, it's not from the presenter's point of view, it's from the audience point of view. That's why you need pauses. Completely agree. In effect, you're giving them yeah. a period of time, albeit maybe only a second or two seconds to reflect. Now, there will be stages within our training where we give them longer than that. Of course there are. But I'm talking about the presentation side of it. And in effect, you're absolutely right. What we are giving is our audience. We are empowering our audience to take ownership of their reflection. What does that do for us as the trainer? It actually creates an enhanced perception of us and what we're saying being more important. So we get a huge benefit from it. But you're right, in effect, the reason it matters is because the audience, the learner, is taking ownership of their own engagement. And if we just talk at them, we don't give them that. You know, we're taking that away from them. So it's, it's, it's a, it, I mean, it's fascinating. The whole thing is absolutely fascinating because Zoom and the virtual world can do so much but it can also, if we're not careful, be just a, a, us talking. And I often, I mean, I often work with organizations on helping them to improve pitches. And uh, you know, I won't name names, but I, I, you know, lawyers, for example, the number of times I've sat in a pitch session with lawyers where they spend too much time trying to tell us how clever they are. And I keep saying to them, you've already, you wouldn't be invited to pitch if we didn't think you were competent. We know how clever you are. Actually, what we're going to buy on is the chemistry, the engagement, the benefit. You don't need to tell us how clever you are. That's a given. And I think too often people revert to the lecture of their intelligence rather than remembering what really matters is the learning, the benefit to the audience, to the learner, that is the, the real key. And that's why we do it, isn't it? So, yeah, I agree with you. I think that reflection part is, is, is absolutely fundamental. OK, any, any more questions before we go on to somebody else telling me a little bit about their story? Yes, Stephen. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Um, Keith, great, great session. And getting some valuable tips uh, shared by you both. Um, I wanted to ask, um, as well as you say, the need to pause, but I, I've obviously, I'm just a bit background. I'm working in higher education. I work as a business consultant. So I'm working with colleges, universities, and businesses. And a lot of my meetings now are on Zoom. Um, a couple of times when I've had to uh, conduct the meetings, I tend to do a pause or I ask them to repeat the question, just to kind of aid to make sure I've heard correctly what they're asking. You're quite right, rather than to just jump in and to just blurt out noise, I tend to listen first and hear what's been said. And if, it's, especially if you've got people from um, where transmission is not clear or they're not very effective with their voice, you, you ask them, do you, do you mind just, just repeating the question? It, a, it gives me a chance to pay attention and listen, but also gives them a chance to reiterate so I haven't missed anything. Is that a useful tip kind of as a way of, you know, charging off and suddenly finding you're missing out on the whole point. I think that's a terrific 
observation, Stephen. And yes, I think it is a useful trick. But like most tricks, we can't use the same trick all the time. Otherwise, we become a one trick pony to mix my metaphors a little bit. So I think it is a fantastic trick. But what I did like in what you were saying there was giving yourself time to actually evaluate, in effect, the question, take it on board rather than just running straight into the answer. And I do quite a bit getting people ready for media interviews or, or sometimes more confrontational presentations as well. And there's a couple of things I try and encourage people to do. One is to be very, very careful about instant positive or negative responses, yes or no. And the reason for that is because, as you've just implied, Stephen, questions can have an awful lot of layers to them. And a yes or a no answer is very rarely as simple as it sounds. And I think if we come with a yes or a no, without reflection, we're in danger of committing to something that we didn't really mean. So I encourage people to ask the question again, that's a lovely one, buy themselves time and have a toolkit of words that enables them to actually give themselves time to get the brain into gear. And that doesn't mean to say we sound like politicians. So the daily press conference, when they were having it, they got into the habit of saying, well, well, thank you, Ruth, that's a lovely question, or thank you for the question, Michael. And all the time it was that. Now, I know exactly why they're doing it. They're trying to soften what they're saying and they're trying to give themselves time. That's one bit of the toolkit. Thank you for the question. But a bit like, could you repeat that question? We need several. And I just think we need several forms of words that give us time to actually get the brain into gear to respond. But the other bit that I think is really interesting, Stephen, and I don't know if, if, if others will have found this as well, but when you're doing a session with people, Asking questions can be quite an intimidating thing for people. And sometimes people as a consequence ask the question in perhaps a more confrontational or hostile way than actually they really mean. So what I always try and encourage people to do is to receive the question in the same way, regardless of the way in which it's asked. So for example, let me give you an example. If I was interviewing Gareth Southgate, I could say to Gareth Southgate, well, it's obvious you've got to start with Harry Kane up front, haven't you? Because he's the only striker you've got. Why would you leave him out? Or I could say to Gareth Southgate, well, Gareth, you've got some options for who to play up front. And I guess Gareth Southgate will be one of them. Which, which way do you think is the right way to go? Now, I've actually asked the same question. But to one of them, Gareth Southgate would probably go really defensive and hostile and not happy. And the other one, he'd be saying, yeah, good question, Keith. You know, that's an interesting way of looking at it. I'm not sure. And I always encourage people to receive a challenge in a positive way so that we can maximize the engagement and the learning. Because if we go the other way, I don't think it's positive, for one thing. I think, secondly, it may have misinterpreted what was actually intended by the question. Also, it's going to make our audience switch off. And actually what we want to do, if we're trainers in any way whatsoever, we want to maximise the engagement and the learning that comes out of it. But a very long winded answer to your question, Stephen, which is, could you repeat that so I can understand it absolutely properly, is, I think, a terrific thing to have in the toolkit to maximise the engagement. But a very long answer to a very simple question. <laughs> right. Any, any more questions before we have one or two more people give their story? Have I got any more? Yes, Justin. Yeah, I, I, was, I was just going to add, Keith, something that I found useful in this online situation where perhaps I've had two screens in operation. I, I tell my audience what I'm doing. So sometimes if I'm looking down at the other screen, I actually tell them, right, I'm looking at my other screen where I've got the details of X, Y, and Z. And I find that just helps perhaps manage the uh, the kind of the scenario uh, what do you feel about that i think that's absolutely right justin so when i'm doing sessions like this i work with two screens as well so very often i'm looking at the second screen and lining up the pictures that i want to bring into play before i do the screen share and you're right by maximizing that engagement and explaining what you're doing you are kind of keeping that magic in play aren't you and, and it is television so what we're not doing is kind of abandoning our audience, but we're using the opportunity to explain. And I think that's that, that absolutely just, and I think that's a great, great idea. Really good little tip, that one. 
yeah, really good. Thank you. OK, any more before we have perhaps two last people telling us their story? OK, I can't see any hands up at the moment. And Amanda hasn't popped up again, which I presume means that there's no more questions. At the moment. So who would like to give us their, their little story now? A little 30 seconds or so. We've got ones here. And yes, Peter. Brilliant. OK, Peter, off you go. Um, I've been a, a trainer for some 35 years and uh, I've done a lot of consultancy over the last 25, but I've moved from that sort of face-to-face -face consultancy thanks to COVID and I'm now delivering courses online and consultancy courses, that is. And one of the fascinating areas is the fact that communication is so critical in a consultancy role and in a consultancy profession and hence the reason I'm tuning in today because it is essential for all consultants to master all aspects of communication and uh, I'm just finding this terribly interesting. Great now two things from Peter one I'm going to call a positive and the other I'm going to call a negative okay one the positive let's do the positive first did you notice how liberated and free Peter's face was when he was talking. So the eyebrows, I love eyebrows, okay? The eyebrows were moving. Now, if you try and talk to someone who you know and like without moving your eyebrows, it is almost impossible. You, you, you just can't do it because you will be doing stuff. Your eyebrows move. And yet I see lots of people when they're in the Zoom world, almost in a straight jacket, with their body and then their face is absolutely tight as well and they don't liberate the face which is one of the reasons why I try and get people to smile but actually using the eyebrows is another part of it and Peter was brilliant with doing the eyebrows now the bit that I'm going to pick Peter up on and to be fair I'm being really harsh here Peter really harsh okay but I don't allow people to come out of one of my sessions when they begin any interaction with uh okay because i tell them no okay if we want to do anything we need to make an impact make a good first impression and if we use uh immediately we are diminishing that first impression and in my very first day as a broadcaster in local radio this is going back an awful long time about 35 years ago now my first ever news editor sent me out on my first ever reporting job where I was going to be doing something live. And it was a guy called Dave Newman, lived up in Hull, and he wrote a book about Britain's last hangman as well, actually. I have no idea if Dave is still alive, but he was a terrific journalist, terrific editor, and also a terrific teacher. And he said to me, Keith, there are two things you must never forget if you want to be in broadcasting. And I was expecting some kind of divine revelation. And actually, to a certain extent, it was because it, it stood me in good stead for the next 20 years when I was in broadcasting. And he said, if you learn these two things, you will never be stuck for words to say. You will never err. Uh, you never need to worry about stumbling. And I thought, what the hell is this going to be? And Dave said to me, well, and now. And if you remember well and now, you need never err. Uh, you certainly need never err uh, at the start of saying something because they buy you time. Well, or now, or if you put them together, well now, and suddenly I've bought myself a second brain in gear and off we go. So well and now, Peter, will I think prevent you from ever starting an interaction with an er uh, again. Yes, John, I can see your hand up. Top tips. Are you just on mute, Don, uh, John? Uh, sorry about that. Uh, I'm going to differ a, a bit about your owns. The Ken Robinson, who's the top TED speaker in the world, 110 million people view mm. view him. If you count the amount of ums he has in the first two minutes, it's about 30, and no one gives a flying monkeys. You know, they, you know, it's it's basically he's himself. He grabs he grabs the audience by being authentic, and it's lovely, and it works. And I'm and I'm and I'm a advocate. I've just done it. I'm an advocate of being a natural speaker. And if an ur comes in, just let it go. 
Right. So I agree with you, John, to a certain extent. OK, so I think authenticity is absolutely fundamental. And in all the coaching, I try and retain authenticity. I'm not trying to get rid of that. However, if we have too many errors, they will distract from the message that we're trying to get across. And the exception that you've said may well be fantastic. But if you listen to Boris Johnson when he's doing a press conference, when he's on script, I'll come to you just in a second, Laura, when he's on script, OK, but when he's in a difficult question, it's, uh, well, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, and I, I, I did a um, YouTube video maybe six or seven months ago now, and I forget the exact numbers, but there was something like 67 errs in a 20 second mm -hmm. bit. Now, Forgive me, but I don't think that was effective communication. So there are always exceptions, always individualizations. But as a general rule, if we can minimize the errors, there will be exceptions, I think, and retain our authenticity. I think we will be better and more effective communicators. Hmm. Laura, I can see you had your hand up. Just a reflection on the, um, the gentleman you first talked about, Ken Robinson, Keith Robinson. Ken Robinson. Are we there? Have I lost you all? No, no, no. Um, I've just done a lovely um for you. He is very studied. It's part of his persona. That's why it's so effective. I, I've watched that or him on some of the TED talks several times. It's part of a very, very well-developed, well-honed performance. Mm. And that's part of why we love him, because he comes on as a bit shambolic, but it's such a well, well rehearsed piece. Mm. Whereas Johnson, for example, because we're talking about him, is just because he doesn't really know what to say. It works for him sometimes if he's doing a bit of a buffoon act, but we have to use this with awareness and we have to have the right character to pull it off, <laughs> I think. Yes. Yeah, I think, I think that, I mean, let's not get in, I don't want to make a political point in the slightest here, but my, my uh, because you could argue at the same time that Keir Starmer lacks personality in the way he comes across and therefore charisma is probably more important than that rather sort of straight down the line approach. But let's not get there. The reason I pick on little things when I'm working with people to enhance their communication is because if we pick on little things, we can make little improvements and gradually we can then keep building the skill set. So we get to the point at which we maximize the effects. OK, and if we if we try and pick on the big thing you know, the, the, as a trainer, one of my dreads is when someone comes on and says, what I really want to learn is charisma. <laughs> yeah. OK, well, <laughs> well we've, got, yeah. <laughs> we've got three one hour Zoom sessions. That could be slightly tricky. So, so also, I completely agree. I don't think we're a million miles away here. I think I think authenticity is absolutely key. I think by doing anything as trainers, we try and enhance little things as well as give a bigger picture. And working on some of those little things can then just mean we focus and realize there are areas where we can improve. So I, I, I think we're probably on the same on the same hymn sheet there. Now, I'm conscious it's three o'clock. I'm happy to continue for a bit if people want and if Amanda wants. But if you need to go, I completely understand as well. Yes, Richard, having picked on you earlier as a silhouette. Yes, Richard. Just a quick one going on the um, and I really respect what, what, what John just said as well. About, I suppose, 10 years ago, I had to do my first presentation to about 30 people and I was absolutely petrified about it. So... I went to one of our trainers and said to Tony, Tony, can you please help me? Can I can I rehearse my presentation with you, go through it and stuff like that? He said, absolutely brilliant. And when I walked into the room, he was standing there and he sat down and he had all these sweets lined up. And I said to him, why have you got all these sweets lined up, Tony? He said, you'll see in a minute. So as I started talking, every umum did, he started trying to sweet at me, which I kind of got, got, got the ump a little bit, but afterwards, it, you know, the story comes up. And um, I said, well, why, do you keep, why were you throwing those sweets at me? He said, because it stopped me from doing the ums, okay? He said, there's nothing wrong with them, but the more, because you're nervous, because your nervousness is coming out from it, you're doing a lot more rooms than you should be doing. So when we actually did the presentation, he was actually in there because he was, he, he was the presenter for this person event. He actually said, my, I only did three ums throughout the whole 45-minute presentation. 
which I thought for me was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, and, and actually, just as a, a quick follow on from that, these these modern inventions of mobile phones are absolutely brilliant because if you want to. I think it's a really easy thing to get rid of. For some people, it may be less important than others. But as a general rule, I think it's better if we can get rid of them. Amanda, you've popped up again, which either means you're telling us to go or you have another question or possibly both. But I think you've also frozen. <laughs> OK, so I'll carry on for a couple of minutes until Amanda pops back in again. Were there any more questions while we are waiting for Amanda? Yes, Katie. Hi there. Um, I work a lot with international students and for them, they, there's worry about ums and ers, especially at the start of presentations. So I think using uh, language like now, well, or having a phrase that they can pull out of the bag to give them that little bit of confidence is key. Um, for me, I make sure that if they have a formal presentation they have to give, that they practice that first sentence over and over and over until when they stand up on that stage or that conference, they know exactly the first words that need to come out of their mouths. And that means that they are super confident, at least for the first sentence. And I then once right. they've got through, they feel so confident. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right, Katie. As somebody who learned Italian, my Italian teacher, I actually said to her, what's the equivalent of well in Italian? And she said, be. So I, I would try and use beh whenever I was about to earn. I'm trying to learn Spanish at the moment. And bueno, for example, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll cut the mustard now and again. But as non-native English speakers, that toolkit of stuff that we can bring into play, could you just say that question again? That's a really important point. I think the most important point here is those things that come naturally to us as English speakers are really difficult to come into play as a non-native speaker. And I think giving them that toolkit, Katie, is a terrific, terrific bit of use that, uh, that is invaluable, actually. In fact, you've reminded me next time I have my Spanish lesson, I'm going to ask my Spanish teacher to translate for me two or three time buyers so that I don't err uh, when I'm trying to, trying to talk my very poor Spanish. Yes, John. I'm sorry to hark on about this, but I will send Amanda the research about about ums and ahs, actually, that most people don't notice them if they're if they're part of a conversation. Uh, and, and so, you know, so the trouble is I work with incredibly anxious people. And if you if you if you make them worry about the ums and the ahs, it just gets in the way. But we're not talking about working with anxious people necessarily here what we're talking about is trying to improve the skills of communicators okay. and actually if the communicator is going to be the most effective he or she can be then we want to give them all the tools in the trick okay but can if i make a plea about, can i make a plea if you are working with anxious people don't start with ums and ohs yeah but, I, I, well i completely agree with you there yeah, i mean if you're yeah. working with somebody who has anxiety what you want to do is work on their best points and develop those yeah. and then gradually yeah. you might i completely agree right. with you. yeah if Good. i was working with a somebody who had a stutter i certainly would not start by picking on something like that i would build their confidence and that's a really important point but i think if we're talking about trying to enhance executives and communicators and people who have come to us to maximize their communication skills then actually that is slightly different but i completely agree with you in terms of you would never exploit and focus in on somebody's anxieties because actually as a coach the biggest sin surely is actually diminishing the confidence and skills of the learner and what we are about if anything is enhancing the skills and confidence of the learner i can see amanda's popped up again did i see another hand come up just finally because if i didn't right amanda sorry back to you that's fine just i just to uh, say thank you for for a great session and i'm sorry for some reason my zoom froze and so the reason why my camera went off was because i fell out of the meeting for some some unknown reason um one question i always ask and, and we'll just wrap up in a couple of minutes now but i always find it really interesting um as a takeaway for for everybody on that's joined us for the session is 
if you had one book or one resource or one TED talk or video that you would recommend to everybody on this call that you know you've read that's sort of inspired some of your work or that you recommend to others what would that be in terms of communication mm -hmm. i don't have a specific one that i've ever done in terms of communication but bear with me just one second when i left the world of tell i didn't know you were going to ask me this amanda but when i left the world of television i was on holiday in america with my wife and we set up our own business and we were at a a bookstore in, I think it was San Francisco. And Alison, my wife, bought me, actually it wasn't this one, it was actually another one by Mark McCormack, which was Never Wrestle With a Pig, but Never Wrestle With a Pig okay. is just about out of print now. But it's Mark McCormack's What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School or Never Wrestle With a Pig. And I'll tell you why, very briefly. First of all, I mean, he's dead now, Mark McCormack, and it's a bit old hat because it was before email. But what he does, and I don't know if you can see that, but I've actually got quite a few bits that are sort of bookmarked in with different stickers. This book is full of anecdotes. So he makes a point about management, about leadership, and then he explains why with an anecdote. And that, I mean, I haven't touched on storytelling today, yeah. but increasingly I'm being asked to talk about storytelling. And that ability to use storytelling, instead of just telling people, but yeah. to explain and to bring people into the fold is fantastic. And I didn't realize, somebody said to me the other day when I was doing a session with them, they said that one of the nicest things they found was when I told stories about Atlantic Dose, yeah. about I don't know, Brian Clough or, or Margaret Thatcher or something like that from my journalistic career. I'd never actually thought about it, which is a real sort of stupidity thing on my part, but I'd never thought about it, but actually that power of storytelling to bring the point that you're trying to get across to life is so phenomenally effective. So that book is one that I, I, I still dip into. It's not about communication as such, it's about leadership and management and business. And it's old, it's tatty, <laughs> but it's brilliant. No, that's, it's really helpful and thank you for that. because I. You know, I, I too, and I can see, you know, on certain people's backgrounds and, and you know, know that so many um, of us in the in the training and learning community, you know, are always looking for another resource to, to read or to think about. So uh, we'll yeah. definitely add that one to the reading list. OK, so we have gone a little bit over time today, but I'm sure everybody will agree with me that this has been a really interesting interactive session. Um, there's a round of applause there from John. Um, but yeah, there's been some great tips. Um, oh, look from everybody. Um, there's been some great tips, some really good insights shared. Um, you know, if, if any of you want to work with Keith directly, then um, they, uh, uh, the organisation is fully accredited with CPD standards. So by all means, do connect um, directly, either through... Um, Keith, I'm sure you can give us your contact details, um, but also through the CPD standards provider pages. Um, and just finally, thank you to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Um, it's boiling hot out there, um, but it's absolutely lovely. And as I've started to say in the last couple of months since the papers came out scientifically, Zoom fatigue is real. So now is the time to switch off literally and go and make yourself a cup of tea or cold drink and just sit in the garden for 10 minutes and kind of do see this as part of your own CPD as a trainer and just think about some of these these thoughts and these these lovely eyeline tips and using backgrounds and gesticulation so thank you ever so much Keith and, and again thank you to everybody and we'll look forward to seeing you on another session soon so take care Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.